Are you having problems with your lawnmower where it's hard to start? Or it starts and then it runs for a little while until it gets hot and then it stops? Or it starts but it's misfiring when it's running? Has it got poor fuel efficiency? Can you smell fuel when it's running? Well if so, then it could be a faulty ignition coil. And in this video I'm going to show you some of the faults that can occur with ignition coils. And as usual you can expect some detail and plenty of visuals. Ok so this video is a follow on from my other video, How a Lawnmower Ignition Coil Works. In that video I went into the inside structure and function of what goes on inside the coil. So in this particular video I shall be showing you what areas that I know of personally that can get damaged in order for that coil to fail. So I hope this will bring you a better understanding about what's going on inside the coil. So let's get to it. When we're talking of the coil we obviously have the sparking system in mind because of course the coil produces the spark for the spark plug to allow the combustion engine to run. So with that in mind, what I'd like to include in this video is not just the failings of the coil itself that prevents the spark from occurring, but some failings around the coil. The failing sparking system isn't always just down to the coil. So at least I want to just skip over some of the reasons that can cause a failing sparking system as well as the coil. So if you're trying to troubleshoot, this will certainly give you some detail there to help you with that. So before we go diving deep into the coil, if we can't get a spark, then it's best to check the spark plug, because this is undoubtedly a more common cause as to why we can't get a spark. And so if all is okay with the spark plug, is it the stop mechanism? Is there some fault there? If there's cable damage preventing the stop switch from disengaging, or the switch itself is somehow damaged, then there could be a permanent earth there preventing the spark. And then there's the stop wire, the earth wire, otherwise known as the kill wire. Sometimes these can become damaged between the coil and the stop switch. And the kind of damage you can sometimes see is that the wire, the outer coating of the wire, can rub through on the engine block. Sometimes as well they can be exposed to heat and burn through. And again that can expose the inside of the wire to the engine block. And what happens there is, is that there's a permanent earth. It does basically the same sort of job as the switch itself when we turn the engine off. So the electric current is now flowing into the engine block rather than going to the spark plug. Of course preventing the spark. And so now we're talking about heat and insulation, let's take a look at the coil itself. Because from what I've gathered over the years, most of the damage that can occur to a coil is due to heat. And to see how that happens, we'll have to take a look inside the coil. We'll see, and as some of you have seen from my other video, the internal part of the coil is not just simply made up of a piece of coiled wire, as the name coil pack might suggest. So if we take our coil here, and take a cross-sectional view from this angle, we'll see Although that it is made of copper coiled windings, there is a little more to it. There's the iron core in the center, and then there's the primary coil here, wrapped around it. Then there's the secondary coil here, wrapped around all of them, and then we have a layer of insulation here between the iron core and the primary coil, another one here between the primary coil and the secondary coil, and then we have the outer insulation encapsulating everything. The wire that makes up the coil windings is also insulated itself. It has an outer insulation like this. So although the coiled wire is wound tightly together and is touching each other, it's only the outer insulation that's doing so. The actual copper wire of each don't actually physically touch. And so when the engine turns and the fixed magnet on the flywheel passes the coil pack repeatedly, creating the electron flow current, all of that current moves in one direction, but it stays within its own lane. In other words, it stays within the core of each wire, within the boundaries of its insulation. 
Obviously, there's not several lengths of wire here touching. The primary coil is just one length of wire coiled round. And it's purposely made just of the right thickness and length to allow the right amount of current through in a certain length of time. The details of this in itself could be a subject of another video, but I just want to concentrate this video on coil failures. But it's this correct amount of current and time it takes to get through the primary coil that creates the optimum strength of magnetic field to allow the coil to work at its best. So from this cross-sectional view, we can see the current moving through the primary coil around the iron core, which is creating that vital electromagnetic field. And this electromagnetic field is designed to be present, like it is now, just for the split second when the fixed magnet on the flywheel passes the coil, and then when the magnet has passed by, it collapses. And so it does this every time the magnet passes the coil. It creates the magnetic field and then collapses, and then creates it and then collapses. But when the magnetic field is created, it's large enough to engulf the secondary coil. And as the electromagnetic field collapses, it moves past the secondary coil. And as it moves past the secondary coil, it's a similar effect as the magnet on the flywheel passing the primary coil. It excites the electrons and gets them to move in one direction. The winding in the secondary coil is much thinner and much longer. And that increases the voltage intensity from a few hundred volts in the primary coil to many thousands of volts in the secondary coil, which is required to create a sufficient spark in the spark plug. So you could imagine that for this coil to work correctly, the strength of this electromagnet must be precise. And a major factor in determining its sufficient strength is what we've just mentioned. This certain thickness and length of wire will give just the right amount of resistance to that current flow to allow it to get from one end of the coil to the other in the right amount of time. So let's say that this optimal amount of electron flow current was somehow disrupted in the primary coil. So let's say there's less current going through it. What would happen? Well, this would undoubtedly have an effect on the strength of the magnetic field produced by the primary coil. So in that case, what effect would that have? Well, if this was the case, and we now have a substandard electromagnetic field here, much less than what this coil requires, then it's not going to have the same coverage over the secondary coil. And of course then when it collapses down to the iron core, like it should do, it's not going to have the same strength to excite the electrons in that secondary coil. And so these secondary coil electrons won't upregulate to a high enough voltage to produce a good sufficient spark for the spark plug to run the engine. And so the question is, what could possibly cause this? Well, there are some things inside of the coil and outside of the coil. So we'll start with the outside. But these are by no means all of the possible causes. They're just the ones that I know of that I'm just going to skip over. First of all, it's well known that the fixed magnet on the flywheel as it passes the coil pack requires a specifically set distance between the magnet and the coil pack. If the distance between the two is too great, therefore the fixed magnet being too far away from the coil pack, then it's not going to produce the same amount of electron flow current through the primary coil. And that's going to result in a less sufficient electromagnetic field produced by it. And so this is one of the disruptions that can occur. So it's always best to take a look at the manufacturer's specifications for an engine of what this gap should be. And as I've said, although this is not the only cause of this problem, now I'll say a little about the primary coil itself. Because we've already mentioned the need for the current to flow cleanly through the center of the primary coil's winding like this, in order for it to generate a sufficient electromagnetic field. And achieving this nice current in the center of the wire from one side of the coil to the other is down to the quality of the outside insulation of the primary coil winding. 
That is, of course, assuming that the copper core itself is in good order. So, assuming that it is, let's now take a look at a scenario where the outer insulation on this wire has been damaged, and then we'll take a look at the possible causes of this damage. So then, if this insulation was damaged, let's say from heat damage, and so that insulation was no longer providing the separation from the inner core of each strand of wire as it coils round, what we would get is a situation where the electron flow current is shorting across from one piece of the wire in a certain area to another. This shorting across of the current means that the current would no longer be flowing through the coil like this as it should be, because as we've said, it needs to travel from this end through to this end in a certain amount of time at a certain speed. Shorting across the insulation like this would definitely disrupt that specific resistance that this wire was designed to give to the electron flow current in order for it to move through it at the right speed and this most certainly would have a detrimental effect in producing the right level of electromagnetic field that this coil needs to produce to make this whole ignition coil work properly. And if we saw this type of damage in the secondary coil, even if the primary coil creating a decent electromagnetic field was all in good order, the likelihood is we wouldn't see that upregulation of voltage that gets high enough to create a good spark for the engine. And it would be a similar situation for the insulative material between the different compartments within the coil. Let's say the insulation here between the iron core and the primary coil for example. Because what we need to remember is that the iron core through the bolts that hold it onto the engine is permanently earthed to the engine body. So if there was insulation and coil damage here then you can see that the electron flow current would take the quickest and easy route out of the coil and that is to the nearest ground and that means it would arc straight through the insulative material here into the iron core because it can sense a ground. That means that the current wouldn't be flowing through the primary coil like it should be and the electromagnetic field wouldn't be produced. If there was insulative damage here between the primary coil and the secondary coil, again we can see there's going to be shorting across from the primary coil to the secondary coil in an area here which is unnatural and undoubtedly that's going to have effects on the way that the primary coil can create the electromagnetic field and also downregulating the effect of the secondary coil. If there was damage to the outer insulation exposing the secondary coil to the environment then areas like this can gather in moisture. As we know water is a good conductor of electricity. The current would short through the water if the water was bridging the gap between the coil and the ground of the engine body. This would be the path of least resistance for the electron flow. It would find that path here rather than go to the spark plug and produce a spark for the engine to run correctly. And if this damage is simply near another area of the engine that's a ground, very very close to it that is, then it's highly likely that this electrical current in here could sense that ground and arc across to it, producing sparks as it does so. So then, if this level of insulation damage was to happen within the coil, then what's a likely cause of it? Well, there may not be one specific cause, there could be several, but a likely culprit is overheating. So that's the key player here. But potentially, how could these coil windings get so hot that it damages their insulation? Well, believe it or not, heat damage to a coil is usually hardly ever down to the coil itself. It's normally down to factors outside of the coil that cause the coil to overheat inside. One cause which I've heard of, which may be related to larger engines like in cars, etc., is the engine itself overheating the cooling system not working correctly. Of course that would create other damage within the engine, but having the engine too hot would transfer that heat into the coil. 
and as the coil's producing its own heat anyway, with the electric current going through it, on top of the fact that the engine is overheating, then the overall heat can be unbearable to the coil. And that, in no doubt, could affect the integrity of the insulation within the coil. So coming back to smaller air-cooled engines like on our small walk-behind lawnmowers and even chainsaws etc, I have in the past known these types of coils to what we consider as being burnt out. So if that's the case then it's likely that these smaller engines for whatever reason could overheat enough to damage their own coils over time. And the thing to remember about this is that the coil won't necessarily just give up and go bad if the engine overheats one or two times. It's working in this heat time and time again over long periods. That's the most likely cause of this type of coil burnout. But in any case, as well as the heat damage to the coil and the insulative material to these coil packs, there are other delicate components such as resistors, transistors and diodes etc within the coil that would undoubtedly get damaged due to overheating. We've covered how overheating can possibly damage the coil and how an overheating engine can contribute to that. But without overheating of the engine, can there still be heat damage to the coil? The answer is yes and let's take a look why. The ignition coil itself, particularly the little more advanced ones, are able to modulate and regulate the amount of current that's produced to be given to the spark plug. So these regulators within the ignition coil module regulate how much current is going through the spark plug to make sure that it's getting enough current to produce a sufficient spark. So let's see a scenario now where the ignition coil is sufficiently working, there's no damage whatsoever. The only difference is we're using an incorrect spark plug. So something we should make clear before we go into this is that each spark plug itself has a specific conductive core down the middle that terminates at the spark plug gap. Now depending on the type of spark plug, will depend on the resistance level that this core has to the electrical current flowing through it. Some types have more resistance than others. So let's say the spark plug on our engine is incorrect and the resistance level down the core of the plug is too high for what this ignition coil was designed to run with. Well, of course, each time the coil creates its electric current to send to the spark plug, the current is obviously going to find it more difficult to travel down the centre of the spark plug to the spark plug gap in order to create the spark. Because this current isn't flowing through the spark plug the way it really should do, the smart regulating system inside the coil pack recognises this and basically it thinks that the spark plug isn't getting enough current. So in response to that it upregulates the current even more with the intention of giving the spark plug the amount of current it needs for a sufficient spark. Basically, it's trying to compensate for the lack of flow going through the spark plug by creating more current with the hopes of pushing more through. But the resistance down the centre of the plug won't allow any more current to flow down there than what it's designed to do so. But nevertheless, the coil continues to create higher levels of current to push through there to compensate and there isn't really a clear path for this high level of current to shoot through because it's slowed down by the high resistance through the spark plug. This creates a lot of heat. So in this scenario using an incorrect spark plug over time is most likely going to result in the coil overheating and damage occurring inside of it similar to what we've just seen. And now let's look at another scenario where the coil is working perfectly and the spark plug is correct. And the only problem being now is the spark plug gap is too wide. Well a similar thing is going to happen now 
The coil will produce the electrical current which will go towards the spark plug. It will have the right level of resistance through the plug for this particular coil. But because the gap is too wide, the electron flow current finds it difficult to arc across that gap to the ground electrode. And that's because it's too far away for those negatively charged electrons in the current to sense the positive charge of the ground from that ground electrode. And similarly to the last scenario, this is causing a restriction in that flow of electrical current out of the system. And again, the regulating system within the coil recognises that this current isn't flowing out like it should be. And as before, that's likely to produce a lot of heat in the coil and result in the kind of heat damage to the coil that we've already seen. So in this scenario, where the spark plug is completely correct, the resistance to the electrical flow is all caused by nothing more than the gap. So in order to be thorough about this and prevent any possible damage to the coil, it's always best to check the manufacturer's recommendations for your particular engine of what this gap should be. And it's this kind of coil damage, by the way, that can apparently occur when we test the spark plugs. Because what we're always told is when we remove the spark plug to test to see if there's a spark, what we generally do is remove the spark plug and then plug it back into the spark plug cap and then earth it out onto the engine body and then turn over the engine. Because what's happening is, of course, the coil's creating the electric flow and then the flow's going through the plug, arcing across the gap and then it's going into the engine body, just like it would do if the spark plug is screwed into the engine. But if the spark plug is hanging freely and not touching the ground of the engine body, then when the engine's turned over, the coil is still producing the electric flow, so the current is wanting to go out of the coil through the HT lead and through the spark plug, but there's a resistance there, the flow can't go any further, because the metal part of the spark plug is not touching the positively charged engine body, and therefore the negatively charged electrons in this electric current flow can't leave the spark plug to go there. In fact, in this situation, the electrical current can't even arc across the spark plug gap because in order to do so the ground electrode would have to take on that positive charge the same as the engine body by touching the engine body and as it is now it's not no matter how much we turn the engine it just won't spark and so the coils work in making electricity like this but there's no flow out and again this can apparently cause the type of heat damage we've been seeing and cause the coil to go bad so it's always best that if you are checking the spark plug like this, to make sure that the spark plug is touching ground. So in light of this, another similar situation can be when we want to remove the spark plug to turn the engine over to check if the engine is turning over freely, to see if there's any seizures of the components, etc. Because of course removing the plug allows us to turn the engine over much freer. So in doing that, to prevent any damage to the coil, then it's always best to make sure that the stop switch is in the off position. Because in this position, any electrical current made by the coil will just go out through the kill wire and straight into the engine body, and it won't cause this kind of heat damage to the coil. OK, so we'll move on now to something that's said to be a very common cause, and that is the high tension lead or the HT lead as it's more commonly known. And these leads are specially designed to carry high voltage out of the coil to the spark plug. But each type of lead that's designed for a certain type of coil is designed with a specific resistance to current flow for that particular coil. And because they're made for each other, electricity flows out of the coil through the lead, through the spark plug and into the engine body correctly and at the right flow for this particular coil. And so let's say that this lead is incorrect. This doesn't happen too much these days with lawn mowers because the leads are generally bonded to the coils. But in the past I have known it where incorrect HT leads have been fitted to coils, usually when some repair work has been done. The problem with that, as we've already seen, the current flow produced by the coil 
needs this HT lead to be correct in order for the flow to flow out of the coil correctly with just the right amount of resistance. And so in some cases these HT leads can be fitted without any consideration to it being the correct resistance for the coil. So if one is fitted to this coil let's say and the resistance through the lead is too high we've got the same sort of problem as we did when we had the incorrect spark plug the electrical current is made in the coil and it's finding it difficult to go through the HT lead to the spark plug and to the engine body and that again produces a lot of heat and potentially heat damage. But let's say this lead is correct for this particular coil we can still have issues here in terms of not allowing that electricity through at the right level and that is if there are slight breaks and gaps inside this lead Obviously you probably wouldn't be able to see this, but if there was a slight gap in this lead, preventing the electricity from just flowing out the way it should do, then it's got to arc across that gap. And if the gap's too much, then of course it won't be able to arc that far. Also the connection between the HT lead and the spark plug cap. It's important to make sure that's a good solid connection and there's no slight gaps there. Because as we've already seen, if there is slight gaps, it's going to cause a resistance for that flow to get out of the coil and it's going to make the coil work harder and cause problems. OK, so what I want to look at now is the insulation within the coil itself. I know we've already been through some of the damage that can occur, but I just want to focus in on the insulation a little more because there is a little more to insulation damage than just heat damage. So we have all this vital insulation within the coil, keeping the compartments of the coil separate and making the coil work the way it should be. But as well as heat damage to this insulation, allowing the electricity to arc across in other areas that it shouldn't do, etc. There are other factors that can affect this insulation. And one is just general aging of the insulation. So in this scenario, this coil could have been working for years. Absolutely fine with the correct spark plug, the correct HT lead, the correct spark plug gap and everything moving in there just fine. But because it's been working every season for many years, then slowly over time this insulation can just start to degrade and have less integrity. And so with becoming weaker and thinner and cracks starting to appear, it can allow that sort of shorting across of electricity as we've already seen. Another thing that can cause insulation damage is excessive vibration. So if the engine is vibrating excessively and it's being used time after time in this condition, this can have an effect on the insulation within the coil and the other components within the coil as well. So possibly why would an engine vibrate excessively? A possibility may be that if it's on a lawnmower, the cutting blade isn't balanced too correctly, or the engine's crankshaft is slightly bent, causing vibrations and of course using this over time might cause damage like this. I'm just saying it's a possibility. And the last thing I'd like to mention is the coil's quality of manufacture. Because the manufacturer makes the insulation for these coils with a special resin called dielectric resin. All that really means is what we've already seen. It can insulate between two electrical conductors those conductors being the coils. So you could imagine then that this insulation has to be made at the best quality it can possibly be to prevent any shorting out of electricity across them. So when the manufacturers make this insulation out of the dielectric resin, they do so in a special vacuum chamber to prevent bubbles forming inside the resin before the resin sets hard. But sometimes, and this may well be, on the non-genuine budget coils more than the genuine ones, it's thought to be quite possible that some of these bubbles are still present. And if there are bubbles present within this insulation, then you can see that it's very similar to having cracks. There's space there to make it more possible for shorting across to occur, particularly when the coil's been running for a little while and it warms up. As we know, with heat, things expand. And any slight expansion on one of these areas with bubbles would open up that gap even more. 
making it even more possible that shorting across can occur. So now we've been through all of that, let's have another look now why the engine will start and then after a little while it stops. Well we have just touched on answering that in the last scenario. If we take a look inside the coil again at the insulation, if there are slight cracks in the insulation, not big enough to let the electricity through, but then when the coil warms up, expanding the components, opening up that gap, then electricity can short through, and that may cause problems with coils when they're warm. And that theory works nicely in for when the coil has cooled down, the engine will start again. Because what's possibly happened is, upon cooling down, that crack has come together again, preventing the shorting across, until of course it gets warm again, and then it will stop. So from what I've mentioned in this video then, is that most of the reasons why a coil goes bad is because the insulation is somehow damaged and loses its integrity. And now we know there are certain things outside of the coil and inside of the coil that can cause this insulation to go bad and lose its integrity. OK, so if you suspect that your coil is at fault, how do we test it to verify? Well, a good way of doing this is using a multimeter. And this really is using the ohms setting on the multimeter to make sure that the resistance through the coil is not too high. Because we now know that a resistance that is too high will cause heat within the coil and coil damage anyway. But ultimately it will reveal that of course the coil has already gone bad. Because something's gone wrong inside there in order for the resistance to be too high. And we've covered some reasons why that may have occurred. So these causes of coil damage are by no means all of the causes. They're just the ones that I've researched that other people know of and some that I've experienced through the years I've been working on lawnmowers and small engines. And I'm also not saying that it's completely correct either because in order for anything to be completely correct beyond any reason of a doubt, there has to be scientific studies performed on them. And to my knowledge, I don't know of any scientific studies performed on these coils that exposes the weaknesses and the areas where they can definitely, beyond any reason of a doubt, go bad. If of course you do know more causes, then please do comment and let everybody else in the community know, because they would benefit from knowing. But in the meantime, I want to thank you so much for watching this video, and I'll be back soon. Thank you for watching.